Hey everybody and welcome to video two of two on this, the Phoenix P1. In this, the first video we looked at what all the buttons were and in this video we're gonna talk about what all of them do. The first thing we're gonna do is put batteries into this camera. The batteries are needed only to run the light meter, but we'll do that so that you can see everything that this camera does. Once you have the battery chamber off, it's this guy right here, what you can do is look at the battery chamber and it's gonna remind you what types of batteries to put into it. So you, it needs two button cells. They are 357, A76, S76, LR44, all the same thing. And the battery housing here has a reminder of how they go in. You can see the shape of the button cell there and then plus and minus indicating which side goes up. The plus terminal has the writing on it. So when you put them in, you wanna be able to hold the battery cap in your fingers and be able to read the writing. Then, simply pop them in this like that, grab your nickel and tighten. If the battery cap doesn't tighten easily, then what you wanna do is back it out. You don't wanna cross thread the battery cap because you could ruin it very easily. So you just, it should just screw in very easily and it should be at just like that when you're done. All right, so now that the batteries are in, you can use the light meter. That's all that they do. They don't have any other function in terms of the overall operation of the camera. Everything else works without them. Next thing we're gonna do is mount and unmount the lens. The lens release button is over here on this side. And so what you do is push it back towards the body of the camera and then turn counter or anti-clockwise to release the lens. Then you can swap out lenses and put a different one on. To put one on, you find the index, red index dot here. This index dot here, you're gonna line them up and turn them clockwise, turn the lens clockwise this time until it clicks. There you go. And that's how you remove the lens and put a different one on. You can do that at any time as long as you're not taking a picture at the time because the shutter curtain protects the film so you can swap out lenses readily. And because this is K-mount, there are a lot of good lenses which are very affordable. Next thing we're gonna do is load and unload film. To load film, we have to start by opening up the film back. And the first thing we're gonna do is grab the film release lever here and we're gonna pull it up until the film back opens and then we can access the film back. Next, we're gonna grab our film and we're just gonna drop it into the film cassette chamber here. There are forks on this right there, you can see. They connect to the inside of the film cassette chamber here so that when it comes time to rewind the film, the camera can rewind that film. Once your film is in, you wanna pull out a leader and you're going to get it into the slot there on the take up spool. There we go. If in advance, you can't advance the film until you've triggered the shutter. So you'll wanna trigger the shutter and advance the film. I'm only doing this so you can see it. Once you get this seated, you don't have to keep advancing. Just doing it once is generally enough. Then you close the, the back of the camera and we're going to take photos until we hit frame one here. That should be frame one. And now if you notice, let's pretend we're not at frame one yet. Watch the film rewind knob as I advance. If this isn't spinning, your film is not loaded correctly. So after you load it, you wanna also take out the tension and then make sure that as you advance to frame one, that that guy is spinning. Next thing you need to do is set your ISO. So to set your ISO, you lift up on this ring here and then adjust it to the correct number. Oops. We put in some 200 ISO film, so I'm gonna set that to 200. So it's just a matter of adjusting this until you find the correct one. There we go. 200 ISO, this is spinning, this is at frame one, we're ready to go and start taking pictures. That's how you load film. Now, as you're going through the day and you're taking pictures, you're going through your roll of film, once you hit the end of the roll, you wanna rewind it. To rewind it, you push this little button right here, the, the lens release, or the, the film rewind release, and then you can start rewinding it. 
this button causes that sprocket, we'll see in just a second, to spin freely. And then you just rewind it until you've rewound the film all the way into the cassette. Film is one and done. So if you open up your film back while the film is out here, you will ruin it. Film can record an image exactly one time, in a controlled manner through the shutter, or in an uncontrolled manner that wipes everything off of it if you open the film back. So don't do what I'm about to do. There we go. So what you can do is you can, right now I'm gonna show you how film moves through the camera. You can see that it's lined up here with these guide rails and the outer guide rails prevent it from moving up and down. You might also be able to see the sprocket here as the film is advancing, pulling the film through, helping to pull it through in conjunction with the take-up spool, but also preventing it from being pulled backwards by the spring memory that forms in the film as it sits wound in a cassette for months or years. When you push the rewind button to rewind it, what happens is that this now spins freely so you can go ahead and rewind the film. So as you rewind the film, you'll get to a point where you're almost at the end and you'll hear, hear a sound like this. It's pretty quiet in this camera, but you can sometimes hear it if, you're, if it's not too noisy. And that lets you know you're almost done. I'm going to not rewind this the whole way because I need to reuse it. But in real life, you would want to rewind that the whole way, take out your cassette, pop your next one in and keep going. Or if you're done shooting for the day, Make sure that you've triggered your shutter before you set your, your camera down for the night. Next thing we're gonna talk about is how to do flash photography with your Phoenix P1. So here, the camera has a flash hot shoe. You can put a flash in there, or you can connect a flash if you have a flash cable with this PC sync port right here. This connects to your flash if, if it's compatible. The mechanics of using a flash are that you want to set your shutter speed to 1 1 25th or slower. For most flash photos, and in general, you just set it at 1 1 25th and that's gonna be okay. The flash will provide enough light, even if it's dark, for the exposure to be accurate. Maybe too much light. This is fully manual. It's gonna be a learning curve if you've never done flash photography on a fully manual camera before. The reason that this is the case is because of the way that the shutter works. A uh, focal plane shutter is basically a pair of curtains in front of the film, right? So first curtain opens, second closes, and then when you advance the film, they move back like that. In this camera, they're actually vertical, but I, that's hard to reach, so we're just gonna do it this way. When you take a picture, the first cu curtain opens, and then if you're at 1 1 25th of a second, for basically 1 1 25th of a second, the film is open to the entire film plane is open to light, and then the second curtain closes, and then you advance and reset. Now, if you set this to one eighth of a second, first curtain opens, the entire film plane is exposed to light for about an eighth of a second, and then the second curtain closes, and then you advance. So what happens if you set this to one two thousandth? First curtain goes, second curtain follows behind, and then it reaches the other end, and then you advance. So faster shutter speeds don't happen because the curtains physically move faster. They happen because of the distance in the gap between the first and the second curtain. And at 1 1 25th of a second, that's the fastest shutter speed where the entire film plane is open to light. So when you use 1 1 25th, the film plane is open to light, the flash triggers, and then the curtain closes. At 1 2,000th, if the slit between the curtains is like this, What's between the curtains will be illuminated. What's behind the curtains will be blocked by them and will not get any light from the flash. So your image would, would basically just be a strip of, of image somewhere along the, the, the frame showing uh, proper illumination with the rest of it being dark. So for flash use in general, 1 1 25th. If you're gonna go slower, you can do that if you want to, if you have a, a dark background that you want to illuminate. So let's say that you're at a fireworks display, okay? And you want to get a picture of your friend standing in front of one of those slow motion fireworks with all of the fireworks trails. So what you would do is you would set it, actually one second would be fine. Set it to one second. Oops. When the firework goes up and starts to explode, 
you take your one second exposure. At some point in there, the flash would trigger, so your, your friends in the foreground would be, be properly illuminated, the fireworks in the background would be draping and caught in slow motion, and it would look like you had captured fast and slow time in the same frame. So any shutter speed will trigger the flash, but it will only work at 1 1 25th and slower properly. When you're using a flash, if you've if you've never used one before, the absolute worst place to put a flash is right on top of your camera, pointing at the subject. If you do that, the light will exit the flash, reach your subject, and then bounce back to the lens, and it's gonna make your subject look flat and waxy. That's why having a PC port here is a huge advantage. If you put a flash on top of your camera, you want to angle it up at the roof, so the light goes up to the roof and then bounces back down at the subject. And that's going to give you a more natural and flattering look because we're used to seeing everything that we see with light coming down from above, whether it's from the sun or lights in the ceiling, whatever it is. That's a good thing to do. A lot of entry-level cameras lack the PC port, which allows you to move the flash off to the side, up above the camera, all kinds of different creative places. And if your flash is over here and it bounces up at the ceiling and then back down, you're getting even better lighting than it bouncing straight up and straight down because you're getting a diffuse light and you're getting rid of any scatter that might happen from dust. A um, little bit technical there, but suffice to say, you can use a flash either in the hot shoe or in, from the PC port. With the PC port, you have the flexibility to use it off camera. With the hot shoe, you want to make sure that you have an articulating flash that can point up at the ceiling or at an angle away from away and up, not just perpendicular or parallel rather with the lens. So the next thing that we're going to do is knowing all of that, everything that we've covered so far, we're going to go through the process of how you take a photo with your Phoenix P1. We're going to assume that there's film in here and that your ISO dial and everything are set correctly. So what you want to do is look through the viewfinder and you want to first get your settings correct. So if you see a red plus or a red minus, you want to adjust the aperture ring and the shutter speed until you find something that you really like. So let's say that you're at f5.6 and 1 1 25th of a second and that's giving you a green dot. Okay, great. Next, if you have a zoom lens, zoom to whatever focal length you want to use, or if you have a prime lens, just simply focus. And when you have your subject in focus, take your photo. After you take your photo, advance your frame. That's how you take a picture with this camera. It's really very simple. And uh, the process is straightforward and, the, and it works basically like any uh, mid-range to even some of the upper. It, functionally, this is almost identical to a Pentax MX, realistically. So even upper range cameras have the same functionality as this. So now let's talk about how to do double exposures with the Phoenix P1. This is a little bit more complicated because it's, it doesn't have a double exposure button. So the science of double exposures is that if your proper exposure is f5.6 at 1 1 25th of a second, one exposure is a proper amount of light for that frame. A second exposure on that frame will make it too, too thick. It will give it too much light and make it hard to, to scan or hard to print. So what you need to do for a double exposure is cut the amount of light in half. Okay, so there's two ways to do that. I don't like doing that through the aperture, although you can make the aperture one number higher, which is one stop of less light as the, as the aperture hole gets smaller. I like to use the aperture. I want to use and have it control depth of field. So generally, I prefer to control the shutter speed, um, to use the shutter speed to control the double exposure. So if we know that f5.6 and 1 1 25th of a second is a proper exposure, we need half that amount of light. Half that amount of light is 1 250th, because this is a fraction, 1 250th of a second is half as long as 1 1 25th. So we're going to take our first exposure. Next we have to not advance this right away. We're going to hold down the film rewind button. We're going to pull out the film rewind lever and hold this and then we advance and then you can take your second exposure 
and then you advance past your double exposure. Now you're not done yet. Because you're basically forcing the camera not to advance the film, when you advance after your double exposure to move the film, the gears don't start to mesh right away. So the, film, the frame's only gonna move part way. So set your aperture down to its smallest setting, set the shutter speed to 1 2,000th, put a lens cap on, and take a dead frame. What the dead frame does is it says that, okay, part of the double exposure might still be behind the shutter curtain, but that advances it past it. And, it, and if, you, if you don't take the dead frame, what happens is you risk your double exposure moving part way and then your next frame overlapping it and potentially ruining both images. And you don't wanna to go to all that work of creating a double exposure just to have it ruined because of the next photo. So the dead frame will help you have better results when you do double exposure photography. And it's mandatory with the P1 to have good results. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.